Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today on the second in our Niagara Now series brought to you by Leadership Niagara. Uh, we are joined today by a wonderful panel of Niagara speakers that will be exploring the topic, what can we do? A conversation about improving diversity and inclusion at work. Uh, but before we get started, we would like to start off today by acknowledging our title sponsor, Nikki and Roland Jagir, uh, for supporting our Niagara Now episode uh, or conversation uh, happening today. So I want to thank Nikki and Roland uh, for their support. We could not have done this without them. So before we continue, we'd like to start today off by doing a land acknowledgement. Again, we might be coming from different parts of Ontario, different parts of Canada, uh, but we like to use the land acknowledgement that we do here, um, being a Niagara organization, to acknowledge the land on which we're on. So with that, I would like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which we gather today has been the traditional territories of the Indigenous peoples for countless generations, most recently by the uh, Odishinoni and Anishinaabe peoples through the Dish with One Spoon Wampunt Belt, an agreement to peacefully share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. This Wampan predates Treaty 3 of the Upper Canada Treaties, highlighting the tremendous contributions these nations have made to our shared history. Today, I would like to acknowledge the, their contributions and how thankful we are all as a people for the bounties of the land that we all share in today. So with that, um, we want to move right along. Um, so Leadership Niagara created the, we created this Niagara Now series um, in light of the global conversations that have been going on and really triggered by the, the larger context of racial equity, diversity and inclusion that has been um, in the news and in the forefront of all our uh, attention for the last couple months. And so with that, we here at Leadership Niagara, we are committed to amplifying the important voices and experience of leaders, including those who you'll hear from today, and uh, towards building a diverse pipeline of leaders through the leadership programs that we run. So as a community leadership organization, we felt it was important for us to be play convener and uh, provide a safe space for dialogue within our community to happen. Um, and so today on our panel, we are pleased to be joined uh, by um, Michelle Grigalski uh, from Empowered, and she's also a Leadership Niagara board member. Michelle, if you don't mind saying hello to everybody. Hi, everyone. I'm Michelle Grigalski. My pronouns are she, her, hers. And as Shane has mentioned, I am the founder of a boutique EDI, equity, diversity, and inclusion strategy and design firm, um, and a part of the board. Glad to be here with you today. Thank you. And next up, we have TK McLennan from Culturosity. TK, please say hello. Hello, everyone. I'm Trisha McLennan, also known as TK McLennan. Um, Culturiosity is an organization that helps organizations to deal better across difference. And my pronouns are also she and her and hers. And I'm really excited to be here and very grateful to be invited to speak with everyone on the panel. Thank you. And certainly uh, next up, uh, but not least of all, uh, Enzo Dividitis, uh, Chair of Pride Niagara. Enzo, say hello. Good morning, everyone. I'm very happy to be here. I hope everyone's having a great day so far. Uh, my name's Enzo Dividitis. I'm Chair and Co-Founder of Pride Niagara. Uh, we are a not-for-profit uh, that celebrates the sexual diversity in Niagara Region's LGBTQ plus community. My pronouns are he, him, his, and I'm very grateful to be here and honored to be sitting here with everyone discussing today. Awesome. Well, thank you, everyone, and we look forward to a really awesome conversation. And so please join us for an hour or so of uh, exploring the conversation about improving diversity and inclusion here um, through our Niagara Now series. We will take questions at the end. Um, our lovely um, board member and chair of our program advisory team, Leslie Calvin, uh, will be playing tech support for me today. And so we'll be monitoring the conversation and the dialogue that's going on um, within the chat box. So please feel free to use that. And uh, disclaimer, if you do hear a dog, the realities of living uh, and doing work from home 
my little pup, uh, two weeks here. Um, he is losing his mind because he can hear my voice and he's wondering why he's not around me. So no dogs were harmed in the making of this episode. All right, so with that, we want to uh, get started and I'm gonna bring our panel uh, up screen. And as well, um, I would instruct everybody, if you would like to see the panel panelists specifically, you can just click at the upper right hand corner where there is the speaker or gallery view. So speaker view will pull in whoever is speaking at the time center to your screen if that's what you want, would like to see. So with that, uh, panelists, are you ready? No tough questions. Um, we're going to keep it light. And uh, we will start off with Michelle, if you're, if you're OK with that. Um, first question goes to you. So why is it important for us that we focus on racial equity and diversity in Niagara? And what's at stake if we do not? I love this question. I love this question because I think it, it speaks to um, our aspirations collectively as people that we want to live in a society and in a community where people are treated fairly, right? Where the way in which you have are treated when you go to the hospital, um, your economic prospects, how you're treated by your financial institution, how you are treated in schools, the potential for you to grow, learn, advance at work is fair and equitable and not based on characteristics such as your gender identity, your indigeneity, your race, your sex, there's so many characteristics um, that are important to who we are and that can limit us. We all want to live in that society. We want our kids to grow up in those, that kind of society. We want our family members to thrive in that kind of society. We want to be fair. Um, but the reality is, is that th there's ample evidence to indicate that despite our best intentions, we are not living that reality today. And when we see the news, for example, what's been going on around George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, we see that happening in the States and it would be convenient for us to believe that those kinds of things just don't happen here. They don't happen in Canada. They don't happen in Niagara. We want to believe that it's convenient to our Canadian national identity as being kind and inclusive people. But the reality is these instances do happen here not only in terms of brutality and the death and murder of black individuals, but also in terms of the inequities that we're seeing across every single facet of society. We know that people are not being given a fair shake um, and that your outcomes in life are determined largely or influenced by your identity. So we need to care about this. We need to care about this because we all want to be the kind of people who are making fair, just, and equitable decisions. And we want to live in that kind of society for ourselves and for future generations. Thank you. Um, thanks for that, Michelle. Uh, TK, over to you. Well, thank you so much. I think uh, that it is very, very imperative, uh, depending on how you want to look at it, just a lot of folks can look at it from a moral perspective and think that it is very important to ensure that everybody feels included. Um, and I know that there are a lot of business people on this call as well. And I think that the research is pretty consistent around what can happen when you do include diverse people. And I say diverse people in all manifestations of diversity, again, whether we're talking about race, whether we're talking about gender, gender identity, um, level of ability, et cetera. Uh, and we know that when we are more diverse and we can find that synergy to make things, um, to make that diversity work for organizations, we know that we have better results. So whichever lens you are looking at it from, it's pretty well established that this is a good thing. Um, in terms of what is at stake if we don't, I think what's at stake is, you know, reputational in terms of if this isn't known as a safe place to be, a safe place to live, then people won't come here. And when people don't come here, businesses can't thrive here. 
And if businesses can't thrive here, then businesses won't come here either. So how you treat people, I think, is very, very important. We know that demographics are changing um, and we're not going backwards. You know, every new wave of folks that come to Canada uh, sort of want to close the door behind them and say, okay, that's enough now. <laughs> that's not really happening. Uh, so I think we need to be very mindful and very forward thinking about A, the kinds of societies that we want to live in, B, you know, what we can do to ensure that our businesses and our economy is going to continue to thrive, um, and C, just wanting to ensure that we live in a place where everyone is going to feel welcome. Thank you. Well said. Well said. Um, Enzo, um, your thoughts on what's at stake if we don't focus on um, diversity here in Niagara? Well, I think this is a great question because I think it worries a lot of people to think about it. And I think it almost frightens some people to have to answer it or have to deal with it. But ultimately, it comes down to if we all want to succeed, if we all want success, whether it's in our personal lives or a business life or across the board, we need to be unified. So we need to build off of each other's strengths. And until we learn about each other and accept each other and bring everybody equally, we're not going to do that. So the one thing that we def definitely need is the consistency um, across the board. Everybody brings in so many different talents and so many different outlooks. So if we don't have equality for everyone, if we don't have that equal opportunity, there is no success. Um, there is no unity. There is no celebration. There, it just doesn't work. I think during COVID is a great example to show how everyone has a different challenge and everyone has a different, different thing that we have to work with and work through. If we come together, which is the only option for success and to learn from each other, um, it, it just brings more to, excuse me, it brings more to Niagara. And that's desperately what Niagara needs and what Niagara wants. I think we can see people now more and more are wanting that. They want that uh, experience. They want that equality and they want to work together because they realize the importance of each person and what they bring to our community. We, you can't have unity. You, if you can't have unity, you can't have success. Yeah, no, well said. And, and I, I think, so thank you all for kind of starting off the conversation on that point. And I think to just to tie in, um, a, a couple observations I've made over the years too, and I've made this, um, I've said this to back in my days in student government, you know, I've often made this, um, share this story and it continues to be the case where the region as a whole loses, when you're talking about what's at stake here, we lose so many international students um, that are brought here through Brock or Naira College each year because the lived experience of those individuals while they're here, so the college or the university is their anchoring point for an introductory point to Niagara, but they don't remain here. And it's and you and half the time I think we tend to think the prevailing reason is the jobs aren't there for the graduates that are coming out. But often very second and maybe in some cases for a lot of people, the first choice for that is to the two or four years that they were here in the region they didn't get a sense of belonging. The, the region doesn't reflect them. So you find where you have students that are coming from different parts of the world that have to go outside of the region to get simple things like food or groceries or things that are familiar to them that reminds them of home. They then seek that type of belonging and cultural connectivity outside of the region. So they go to Toronto, they go to other places, even though they could find a job here. And you hear time and time again, these similar stories of international students that would love to stay in the region, but for some odd reason during their time here, they didn't have a chance to connect with the community because they didn't see themselves reflected. So what people do is you move towards communities that look and sound like you and where you feel like you belong, um, even as a prevailing Thought. So I've often said this and encouraged mayors when we've had conversations in the past about a Niagara Region initiative to ensure that we welcome international students, much like the city of Toronto does, every single year in welcoming the thousands of international students to the big city of Toronto. And so little things like that where we're losing out on all those potential 
each year that Brock and Naira College recruits students to the region, we're losing so many talent that could be staying here just based on the fact that from a cultural sense of belonging, they haven't found a place and they've sought that somewhere else outside of the region. So I think that in and of itself is such a good example of why we ought to be focused on this. So thank you guys for sharing, um, sharing with that. And I wanna follow up with a question and I'll start with TK on this one. Um, oftentimes there's a misalignment between intent, plan and action. What questions or things should companies be doing to ensure greater alignment? Thank you so much for that question, Shane. I think one of the things in, uh, in terms of people's, you know, initial commitment or desire to start to make change. In, in our culture, we have an, a, a bias for action. So we want to get started and we want to get going. And it's a wonderful thing. However, sometimes you really need to take a step back and really assess where you are. So running ahead without actually knowing sort of your positionality around, well, are there things that are working for us with respect to diversity and inclusion? Are there things that are not working for us? And very importantly, have we actually asked our people <laughs> <laughs> whether or not approaches that we're taking with respect to diversity and inclusion are actually working for them. Um, so really being able to assess and dig into where we are and establish um, a sort of a benchmark of where you're at and then looking strategically and realistically at your organization and what your capabilities are uh, in terms of where you, you want to go and how you want to embed that in your strategy, I'd say you treat it almost like any other business issue that is important to your organization. And you make sure that you embed that, you make sure that it is resourced, you make sure that it is measured and that it is aligned with the direction that your company wants to go. So those are some of the things that you know, through, for example, through Culturiosity, we help organizations to think that process through, as opposed to, you know, um, I think we spoke about this yesterday. Uh, there was something on LinkedIn where a person was saying, I will not do two hour training. I will not do two, I'm repeating it because a two hour training or a little lunch and learn is not going to be the silver bullet that's going to take you from where you are to where you want to be in terms of creating the type of inclusive environment that is going to have people want to stick around and be excited about getting up in the morning and coming to your workplace. Mm -hmm. So assess, assess, benchmark, and know where you're at and determine where you're going with respect to what your business goals are and what your goals are in terms of ensuring that your organization is really embracing and embedding diversity and inclusion. Thank you. Um, Michelle, do you want to take a stab um, at um, just sharing, you know, how do we get better alignment between intent, plan, and action as we see companies now striving to, to, to do better in this space? What TK said was critically important. Um, we absolutely have to ask ourselves, where are we today? And where are the specific opportunities for improvement? Um, and I would add to that, that it's important that we break it into three separate components. The first is with regard to diversity. So what are the differences within our workplaces today? The second is in terms of inclusivity. What are people's perceptions or feelings of belonging? Do they feel safe? Can they be their authentic selves at work? And the third is with regard to equity. So that is taking a look at the employment experience of your people broken out across identity characteristics. So are women less likely to get promoted than men? Is the turnover rate higher for your black colleagues than your Caucasian colleagues? Are you finding that development opportunities are going to people who do not have disabilities versus those who do? So the data is critical because it ensures that you are not taking a scattershot approach to your EDI strategy in your business. In order to be effective, it has to be evidence-based and it does need to be centered on what the real barriers are within your organization. And then further to that, exactly what TK said, I think we're, there's some telepathy going on here. Um, you you want to make sure that you have a strategy around it. Um, and that strategy, exactly as TK said, it needs to be informed 
by people in your organization. Uh, there's a really great saying that I've learned from a number of my black colleagues, nothing about us without us. Nothing about us without us. And I think that goes for every diversity group. If you are a well-intentioned white person or person of privilege, and you think that it's your responsibility to go and to build a strategy that is going to um, break down oppressive systems by yourself, well, you are mistaken because in fact, that is not the right thing to do. You must engage diverse voices. You must listen and learn from diverse individuals within your organization and community and your customers um, in order to be effective at devising solutions and rolling those solutions out. So have a strategy, but make sure that people's voices are at the center of that strategy and that you are engaging them to co-create and to participate in a way that makes sense for them. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, and then uh, over to you, Enzo, on the same question. Um, how do we get, from your view, better alignment between what we also want to do and what we actually do within our organizations? Well, exactly what TK and Michelle said, but I think it's really important to remember that you really, uh, like they both mentioned, you really have to identify the, the issues and the problems that you are experiencing first and foremost, but you definitely have to involve your uh, coworkers and you have to involve everyone together in that process. But be during that process, I think it's really important to remember to become an ally, to become a supporter it's not just something that you can say, okay, now we have this, now we are allies, now we are helping this minority, now we are showing equality. It's a process. It's not just something you, it's not just a sticker, it's not just a two hour course, it's not just something that they can do that one meeting or that one day a month or maybe that one month. It's a continued learning process. So it's, you have to be adaptable and you have to continuously take in information and you have to continuously reach out to people, update yourself and have that open mind. And I feel the intent a lot of times is there, but sometimes the actions don't follow up the intent equally or their, your intent of the employer's intent may be to help or may be to show that diversity. But unless you're continuously educating yourself and involving all the members in there with equal voice and equal acknowledgement, um, it's a lot it's a lot harder. So that's something that we have to remember at all times, but definitely remember that it's a process. It's not just a sticker. It's not just a day. It's not just one movement. It's not just a hashtag. It's a process. Yeah, and, and I have a very interesting follow-up. Um, I think it's interesting. Um, Follow up to that as, um, and so you mentioned the, you know, the, the sticker tag hat aspect or the um, hashtag effect. Um, where where is that balance now because i think we see some of the well-intentioned um but what's what's what are the i'm interested to get your thoughts on the balance between that well-intentioned hashtagging you know sticker it's pride month so everything's pride and rainbows for right. the months and then uh there's no there's no action beyond that right where's that where's that as a person of uh, within Pride Niagara and of a specific community, how do you reconcile with the like misalignment or the mistreatment of that alignment so that it's, uh, you know, it's, it saves space in the public eye, right? So we're one of the many companies that have a Pride, you know, version of our logo and we put it up, but we've never actually supported an event or acknowledge your, you know, LGBTQ plus employees. How do you how do you advise people to go about that um, work without it being like okay we have a we have a sticker but th there's no other substance to that or the mark right. is capitalizing on the the movement how did what are your thoughts on that um, I feel unfortunately too often that does happen especially in the month of June because I feel like a lot of companies think that it's their obligation, that they have to join that celebration. But it's a, I, I think uh, the accountability has to go with the acknowledgement. Because if it's only the acknowledgement during that one time of the year, or if they put up that sticker, if there's no accountability, if they're not involved with the process of learning and educating and celebrating, just to show up for the celebration part, I think it shows it right then. A lot of times you can see it, 
if uh, I've, it's quite clear, especially if you are a minority or you are part of that community, you can identify it rather quickly to see that this company or your coworkers or your employers are not necessarily a part of the process. They are just putting something out. There's no talk about pronouns. There's no talk about the cultural and historical events that go along with your community. Um, there are several days throughout the year that they could be celebrating or acknowledging something of, of that minority. And if they're only doing it during that highlighted calendar month, those are examples. They just definitely have to be accountable. But I also feel it's part of the community ourself to hold them accountable. Too often, like growing up in the Niagara region, as I'm as a gay man growing up here, um, initially I felt our community just wasn't being highlighted or acknowledged. And, and then I, that I learned that to be true, but I also learned that our community doesn't feel they're, they're owed it. So as a community member, I started to access our community more and reach out more and ask people to be accountable. Sometimes the intent is they want to be, they just ha didn't have that opportunity or that education. So as a community member, you, we need to reach out and ask people to be held accountable because they're quickly going to turn the eye if we don't say what you're doing is wrong. Uh, that we, there needs education, there needs to be accountability. This is a process, it's more than just a sticker. If we don't ask for it and sometimes hold people accountable, if we don't do that, it's very easy for people to turn, the, turn the, their eye and just ignore it. So I think it goes hand in hand, it's a responsibility. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, and I think that goes uh, right into my next question in terms of where is the shared leadership uh, come in as far as diversity and equity um, plans or actions across a, in an organization? Uh, Michelle? So unsurprisingly, you'll hear me say that it needs to be both bottom up and top down. So as we've talked about, you do need to engage individuals in your company, but also outside of your company, your customers, your board, your shareholders, they need to have a voice in this as well um, in order for those initiatives to be informed, um, in order for them to be effective and relevant. So full stop, you need to engage people. But I've seen a number of organizations that their EDI strategies don't land because the executive team isn't really that bought in. And to Enzo's point, they've got the sticker, right? And they're probably, maybe they're writing a check, but they're not doing the work themselves. And what I hear often from my clients is that there's skepticism across the entire organization for all of these well-intentioned initiatives that are rolling out because they're not hearing the executive team talk about this authentically, and they're not seeing it substantiated by real change in behaviors and actions. So there needs to be work at every level of an organization, but critically to engage those change agents and to work with the executive and senior leadership team so that this is not just something that's programmatic, but that it's something that's linked to business strategy that's embedded across the organization, all departments and functions, and is seen as something much better or bigger than a, a PR statement or a platitude. Thank you. Um, TK. Yes. So Echoing some of the things that Enzo um, mentioned and really also agreeing with Michelle in terms of from an organizational perspective, uh, having both top down and bottom up approaches, I think is important. But um, Enzo's comments made me want to realize there's something important that I want to say is to please honor the activists because there are folks who are out there in this community, in Niagara region, who are shining a light on what are some of the major issues and what, have, what are some of the um, really big things that are needed in order to move this forward. And I think too many times organizations will look at that and think, okay, these folks are, you know, uh, too radical or out to lunch or whatever the case may be. What I'm arguing for is to pay attention to what the activists are saying, what they are asking, and what elements um, you need to consider. There's a big part of this that really requires people to come to the table in a way that's humble, 
in order to be able to actually hear what people are saying the problem is. And a lot of times, unfortunately, we are in within our own bubbles and whether we're talking about a business bubble or any other kind of, and we're focused on the bottom line and all of those things, there's nothing wrong with that per se. However, in order to move diversity and inclusion in your organizations, I think it's very important to pay attention to the broader community and what is being said there, as well as to what folks in your organizations are saying. So if you're to be a really effective leader, then it is important to consider those, um, those areas and include that in, in your plan in terms of how you're going to build this out. To, to what Michelle said, this is not something that you do alone. This is not, okay, you are gonna now take it and run with it and you know, take all of the accolades. Recognize and ensure that you are giving credit where credit is due. People spend time on committees in, in um, diversity and inclusion, um, uh, uh, what do you call them? Um, Task force? Right, like the different task forces, the different um, affinity groups and whatever you have it. If your organization isn't rewarding people for spending that time, then you're just having people kind of spin their wheels and making it look like you're doing something when in fact, again, your, your, your words are not matching your actions. You're not putting you know, the proverbial money where your mouth is. Um, with respect to these things. So, and I think this was something Michelle mentioned as well in terms of making sure that A, you are modeling what you're asking people in your organization to do. If you yourself are not a model of embracing diversity and inclusion and listening and taking action and being a good ally, then it's going to be very difficult for the rest of the folks in your organization to get on board. Similarly, if you're on a task force related to diversity and inclusion and you're seeing no movement at the top, eventually people lose interest and it just becomes sort of a, you know, people feeling like they're spinning their own wheels and decide that they don't want to participate in a, in a sham. Um, so all of these areas are important, I think, in terms of making sure that your initiatives are genuine and not just for the purposes of PR or marketing or making it look. If it doesn't pass the smell test with the people who work for you, if you really engage with people who, and you make it safe for them to tell you the truth about their experience, and they're telling you that their experience isn't good, then you know you're not on the right track and something actually really needs to change. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Enzo, any thoughts to share on the where you, from your perspective and experience, where the shared leadership needs to kind of take place within um, any effective diversity and inclusion work? Uh, I definitely want to follow up on what TK just said. That's exactly, exactly it. If the people are not paying attention if they're not felt that they feel comfortable to share their experience and it's not valued and listened to, then there's just no, it, you're doing something wrong. Like, uh, I feel too often that people are just spinning their tires and they're not being rewarded here. Uh, there is a lot of opportunities. There's a lot of networking. There's a lot of uh, boards that people have been a part of, but I honestly do feel they feel that they're spinning their tires and it's not being acknowledged enough and that's what the struggles that I face a lot um, in Niagara and I think that that's something that we really need to focus on because everyone's intent is there but it doesn't feel that it doesn't feel genuine a lot of the time so I think that's something we can work on and it definitely needs to be focused on yeah no, thank you. Um, and so just even going ahead, and I think I saw this question um, from somebody in the, in the room as well, and we have it here. So how do you suggest companies go about culture change when it comes to diversity and inclusion? Um, it's a, it's a two-parter. And so how do you create spaces for diverse voices to be heard and understood in the workplace? So how do they go about getting that um, starting off, how do we get the train moving on 
this whole understanding and acceptance of diversity and really living the strategy. And I'll start with Michelle this time. TK used a word a couple of moments ago, which I think is just so important. And that word is humility. So in order to change our cultures, which are very much, it doesn't matter what sector or what industry you're in, or even what part of the world you're in, our company cultures are centered around you being an expert, you showing up to work and proving to everybody how smart and competent you are, right? I mean, that's how we screen candidates and their resumes. It's what we're we tend to source for in terms of our select for in, on the basis of our interviews. Um, we tend to focus on what do people know? And as people, we try to show up and, and demonstrate that we have all of the answers. We cannot apply that mentality and that lens to EDI work because regardless of who you are, myself included, it's impossible to be an expert on all things EDI, right? I'm speaking to you right now from my perspective as a white millennial woman. I don't know what it feels like to be a trans person. I don't know what it feels like to be a baby boomer. And so I am going to be biased in my views and I'm going to make assumptions on the basis of my own experience that might not be reflective of your experiences. So I can't come at this from a, I have all the answers perspective as an EDI consultant in the same way that you as a leader or an employee in your organization cannot come at this from a, I, I know everything. We all have to be humble here that this is a learning journey and that when we know better, we do better. So the key to culture change, I believe, is having the courage to admit that we are not perfect, that we are sometimes going to say and do things that are counter to our intentions of being fair, inclusive, diverse. Um, and that when that happens, we have to call each other and ourselves out on it. It's okay, right? There's no shame in admitting that you've made a mistake, but there is shame in making a mistake and not, well, not shame, shame's a bad word, but you know, don't make the mistake and then continue to perpetuate it or to pretend that it didn't happen. We all have to take accountability here and get really comfortable being uncomfortable because change does not happen in this space unless we're willing to accept the fact that none of us have it 100% correct all of the time um, or that, you know, there's no room for improvement. We absolutely need that. So humility and courage to me are the two touchstone words that need to be embedded in every organization and alongside that an establishment of psychological safety. So right from the top down that it's okay for people to learn, to grow, to make mistakes, to iterate and having everyone across the organization start to demonstrate that, you know, it's okay. We're going to share stories. We're going to ask questions in the spirit of learning. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, TK. So from an organizational perspective, change is exceptionally hard, especially when we're talking about culture change. So I think, first of all, acknowledging that this is not an easy thing. This is not an overnight thing. And this is a thing that requires investment and um, resources and a whole bunch of other different things. Um, when we think about the environment that we're in right now, so for example, um, you know, well, what was, you know, the impetus to, to move uh, something like this online? It's like, was it a strategy? No, it was COVID-19, <laughs> you know, and I think a lot of different organizations are, are in a situation right now where folks are having to scramble and make all kinds of changes that even six months ago, if you ask anyone, they probably would have said, oh, that's impossible, or we cannot do that. And so what my point is with respect to, well, how can you make a culture change? We're at a point right now where we're in so much flux and we're in so much upheaval that I think it does present an opening, particularly for um, organizations that do want to commit to diversity and inclusion to leverage the situation that we're in right now, because we're not going back and so what does forward look like? So again, assessing where we're at. How do we meet people where we are? When it comes to diversity and inclusion, people are at all sorts of uh, different points in terms of 
how ready they feel or how prepared or how well versed. So I think it's going to, uh, you need to approach it like any other change management program that your organization wants to do. So you assess where you are, um, you create the conditions for change by reviewing your systems, you then start to implement change, you start to make sure that people are educated and understand what is being asked of them, and that you have the folks at the top modeling that you're listening to and paying attention and taking information um, from folks throughout the organization, making sure that everybody is involved and bought into the process. And then you use all of your different systems to ensure that those changes stick and that they stay. And so again, just like what folks have been saying, this isn't a one and done, one shot and you're done kind of thing. This is an ongoing thing that is gonna be continually refreshed and um, need to have input and making sure that that is managed in a way that you know the research is out there, the tools are out there to give an organization the best shot possible at embedding this change in a way that's going to make it stick. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for that. Enzo. Uh, just to add on to what Michelle and TK said, they both hit the nail on the head perfectly. Uh, I think one thing that we have to remember, which is sometimes a lot harder to remember is during this process that we need to have patience and we need to understand that it is, it is, it is a process and it's not something that happens overnight. That being said, the patient has to be working hand in hand with accountability. So, because too often employers will say, oh, we're working on that, we're working on that, we're just waiting for this to come in or waiting for people to sign up or waiting to see if anybody speaks up and says something. Sometimes it's not very comfortable to do that. So we need that patient, but we definitely need to have it with accountability follow up things. Uh, if you realize that there is a bit of a struggle, start the ball rolling. Like put, you can put some more suggestions in. Make, do what you can. Like Michelle said earlier, I, I always say that when you know better, do better. You have to do that. Like we continuously have to be processing ourselves and evolving. So if we can be putting out some of that information to encourage it, to show that it is something that's needed in our workplace, and this is the perfect time. Like COVID, everything's changing. Like Michelle said, there is no going back. This is what's happening now. Everything has to be, everything's being updated. Everything's being renewed. So this is the perfect time to start implicating some of those changes. But patience and accountability go hand in hand. And it doesn't have to be an aggressive fight for something. So I always say, like, check to see if the door's unlocked before we start kicking it down. Uh, we're so, people are so frustrated with due cause, absolutely, that we just get very aggressive with it right away. We want to just like push through. And I, for myself, that's really hard at times as well. But I always remind myself, like, just check that door because it could be unlocked. Like I, we could just walk through that door. And then when we're there, once that light is provided, let's use that light for good and use that to, to start encouraging people to make that change, to start uh, encouraging people to show them the which way to celebrate these cultures, to show their diversity. So it's patience and accountability, hand in hand. Shane, yeah, can yeah. I just piggyback on that really quickly? Yes. I, what, what comes to mind as I hear Enzo speak is diversity fatigue, which is a real thing. Um, you're going to want to do everything right now because you're going to do your data, you're going to listen to your people, and a number of opportunities for improvement are going to come up. What's critical is that you do a realistic number of things well. So when I work with clients, I suggest three to five. The research substantiates that three to five is a manageable amount within an organization to focus on your EDI strategy. Do those things, do them with depth, make sure that they are planned and implemented thoughtfully and that they will garner meaningful results rather than trying to do everything under the sun and risk doing nothing well and potentially having a backlash effect, right? Of people thinking, this doesn't work. We tried it. The potlucks, what did they do? You get what I'm saying. So diversity fatigue is real. Uh, make sure that you're, you're pacing yourself. Yeah, no, thank you for that. And, and I think um, a follow-up to, to um, the question um, that you guys just answered, you folks just answered, is around that balancing act of how do you create the space for the diverse voices to be heard, 
without verging into that space of tokenism. So I'm the lone black person in the staff and I'm called on to lead the task force on diversity where in our conversation last week, you heard some of those leaders talk about, you know, we don't speak for every person. So whether the, the one gay person is not the, the loudspeaker or the chosen one for the entire community. So for you, for, for, the, for the three of you, if you could quickly comment on how do you suggest people go about and balance the idea of creating space, equitable space, without it being a tokenized effort of, oh, yeah, let's find one of every color, like we're making a cast of Power Rangers, and let's put them all at the table. We're diverse. Like, how do we get away from that college university brochure of diversity to actual um, diversity at the table? Um, I'll start with uh, Michelle. Love that, the Power Rangers, that's hilarious. Yeah, so I have not met a single person who wants to be a token, right? Like I certainly don't wanna be hired because I'm a woman. Um, I wanna be hired because I'm the most competent and qualified person for the role. But I also recognize that when organizations and hiring managers are assessing for competence and qualification, that they're doing so with an ideology that tends to skew them in favor of a different profile than potentially me. And certainly a different profile than a person who is indigenous or black or trans. I mean, the list goes on and on or has a visible disability. Um, so we do need to focus on improving our diversity representation intentionally because we know that the systems in place today for evaluating talent are biased. I mean, just think right now, if I say the word um, leadership presence, right? Who comes to your mind? Like, be honest with yourself. You have an, a mental image that comes to your mind when I say leadership presence, and it might not be what you want it to be. It might not be George Floyd, right? You might be categorizing him as somebody who is dangerous or criminal or less trustworthy or less competent on the basis of what you've learned from the news, right? Or from the shows that you've watched. Um, we all have had these kind of problematic associations that we've learned by virtue of being a person in this world that change our lenses and change the way that we evaluate things like who's gonna be a good candidate for this role or who's the most deserving of a promotion or who should get this really great project that's going to expand their network or grow their career prospects. So I say that because oftentimes when we create diversity goals of bringing in more people who are underrepresented, people think it's just a checkbox, right? Like, look, we have black people in our organization and that's not it. What we're trying to do is reduce the barriers that prevent black people from entering into the organization in the first place and advancing and thriving within. And it's not just black people, it's across a number of dimensions. Uh, but I think race is really important right now uh, and particularly for us to talk about um, the challenges black people face. So we do need to have a deliberate focus. Um, in terms of tokenism, we absolutely, when you're doing your EDI work, need to be forthright and transparent with people about what your efforts are and what they are not. This is not about, to your point, Shane, the Power Rangers thing, right? This is not what this is. So being clear, we're not doing tokenistic approaches. We're not hiring people who are not competent or qualified. We're just changing the way that we define what competent and qualified is to make sure that it's fair and biased, uh, unbiased, not biased. So I think that clarity, that transparency is really important. Anticipate what the resistance is going to be. Think about what colleagues might challenge, what they might be thinking but not saying, and then go there, go there. You might be thinking this, here's another way of interpreting it. This is what our actual intention is and here's why it matters to our business. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so I'll piggyback um, with a, a question then I'll pass it on to, um, to TK. Um, as, as Michelle's leading us down in, in her response to that question um, about the often comment that we hear a lot of times where, well, we just hire or promote uh, the best person for the job regardless of race and gender. So tying that in, how do we counteract those kind of sentiments um, as you go about addressing the tokenistic um, approach? Uh, TK? So that's a very, very important question. And I think it comes back to, again, what lens or what view people are taking on these issues. 
um, there unfortunately seems to be an assumption that, you know, when you want to pervert, pr promote diversity and inclusion, or let's say, for example, in certain situations, folks want to do a targeted hire, like this is going to be designated for Indigenous people, or this is going to be designated for a person with disabilities or that kind of thing. Then you get this idea that this person isn't actually qualified, that this person is being hired specifically only for their phenotype or, you know, their level of ability or for their gender or whatever the case may be. Um, and so when that person enters into the organization, how can they possibly be effective in terms of working with colleagues if the majority of their colleagues are people who think that this person, you know, kind of slid in without any qualifications? And people spend a lot of time sort of marking this delineation or so sort of a counter argument to diversity and inclusion to say, we want to hire the most qualified person for the job. And that's not a bad thing, but there's an underlying assumption that comes with it that the racialized person or the person with a different is not going to actually have qualifications. And so I think with respect to, to tokenism, it is, it's sort of a double trauma to the person that you're putting in the position. You're not doing a person any favors by hiring them and putting them into a hostile situation. So in terms of what can you do, you really have to educate your people on what diversity and inclusion is, what it means, why your organization is engaging it, what is the benefit. So some of the benefits that come along, for example, a colleague of mine explained to me um, I grew up in Toronto and would take the TTC regularly, would miss my stop often. And then suddenly one day they had a, a, a sort of electronic thing up that would announce the stop and an automated voice would come on and also announce the stop. And I thought, wow, they're so forward thinking at TTC. This actually makes my life that much easier. So I don't like nod off and miss my stop. And my colleague who has a specialty in um, uh, accessibility and anti-ableism explained that, that somebody took the TTC to court over years. They spent millions of dollars fighting <laughs> to not to have to do this, to not to have to implement this system that virtually every single person who now takes the TTC benefits from. And so it's very important to understand that a lot of times when diverse people come in, they're kind of that canary in the coal mine, sort of sniffing out the problems. And I'm not sure about anybody else, but I don't want to be a dead canary. Right? <laughs> I'd like for folks to have the forethought about what that experience is going to be like before thrusting somebody into it. So I think this issue of tokenization isn't just, you know, a thing that's uncomfortable for the person. These are the kinds of things that lead to health problems and shortened lifespans, right? Um, Anti-Black racism was just declared a health crisis in the city of Toronto. So I think it's tremendously important that while we are well-meaning that we do take a level of, of sobriety in terms of engaging these issues and doing our absolute best to ensure that those folks who are coming in who are of whatever manifestation of difference are actually supported and that we are using all of our organizational systems to make sure that we're educating folks so that when people come into the organization, they will want to stay. Mm -hmm. So those are some of the elements that I think are very important to highlight in this discussion around tokenism. Yeah, um, Enzo, um, to you. So, you know, I'll combine the, that for you where, you know, we're addressing the tokenism aspect, if you have anything to add uh, to TK and Michelle, but also, you know, the we hire regardless, um, we hire the right people, not based on gender or, or sexual orientation or anything. 
any thoughts or comments on on that? How do you counteract those set sentiments? Uh, I think TK and Michelle like hit the nail on the head again perfectly. But um, I I feel if like we said earlier, if it's just the education and the the process and the if things are very clear before. Um, you can avoid this. Like if the conversation is there with the employers, if they do the education prior to this, if the everything is very clear uh, uh, with all our coworkers and everyone that they know this is like a journey they're going on before they all of a sudden start doing this type of targeting hiring. So everyone knows they aren't hiring the person that's best for the job, but they're, sh they're hiring the person that's best for the job through diversity. Um, once they, that has already been incorporated into their everyday and everyone is a part of that process. But at the same time, I just want to touch on that. Unfortunately, that is happening. Unfortunately, that is the reality right now as well. So I always try to find like double sides of a positive. Like Obviously, I want to change that. Obviously, I want to uh, keep this process going. I don't want that to have to be the struggle. And I want to do my best to alter that and improve that. But at the same time, I, I have been called myself like the go-to gay guy from leaders in our city, uh, leaders in Niagara. And I take that and I look, I try to, I know that's a, a negative, but at the same time, I try to find that positive spin on that. So if I am that power ranger, if I'm one of those power rangers that, that were selected, power rangers, they're there for a purpose and they have a lot of strength. So I'm gonna use that to make sure I'm no longer a token. I'm going to bring more people on and I'm going to work from the inside out. So I'm going to try to do my best as that token um, to make sure this isn't happening anymore because it's, sometimes it's a lot easier to work from the inside out and I can start changing those minds. So at the same time, I can do both. I can un make the best out of that situation and hopefully prevent it from being a situation in the future. Yeah, and uh, it, it's, it's a lot harder, but you know, I, I feel that as a minority, as a community member, it's an obligation. Mm -hmm. and, and you raise such a good point, and even back to, I think what all three of you have said consistently throughout this is in the process of exploring and asking those individuals within that group that you're trying to create space for, you will find the version of Enzo that's like, I'm willing to be like I have a broad shoulder, I can I can do this for everybody. But you will also find um, if you ask the right questions, you'll be able to identify the Enzos, and they'll also be able to identify those that want to be part of the process but cannot bear the burden of being that single you know voice of the people, right? So it really kind of ties back perfectly um, to what the group has said today in terms of if you start with that appreciative inquiry and asking the right questions and being thoughtful, you'll be able to suss out these things and find whether it is the person that does have, to Enzo's point, those broad shoulders that can withstand the brunt of, you know, being the go-to it person uh, for the topic and may not see that as a negative, but internalize that as part of their burden to bear and their responsibility in creating space and unlocking that door for other people to come through. So well said, Enzo, and I thank you for sharing that. Um, and as we approach wrapping up, one of the things I wanted to ask you quickly, um, and I'll start with uh, TK maybe on this one, is, you know, we brought up a number of different challenges potentially in executing the uh, diversity and inclusion strategy. Um, are there any major pitfalls that, um, you know, beyond being mindful of tokenism and stuff, any pitfalls as we kind of wrap up um, that you think the leaders and managers in the room need to be aware of, or a few of them, I'm sure there's a lot, but anything that you could say that, you know, we should be avoiding as we look to implementing strategies? Well, I'm, I'm gonna put a little bit of a spin on it in terms of maybe not what to avoid, but not to avoid, but what to engage. And I think one of the most important elements um, for anyone embarking on um, this kind of work or being involved in this kind of work, which I think should be everyone, it's everyone's responsibility, but I cannot underscore the importance of self-awareness in terms of how you're going to be able to show up for these things. 
Um, I can't tell you, for example, how many uh, workshops I've, I've run or how many different trainings I've run where I've had somebody say to me, well, I don't have a culture, I'm just a regular Canadian. And so some folks think that culture is for somebody else or that these differences, but if you have the self-awareness in order to understand your own social location, the elements that make up your identity, whether or not those elements are things that have been you know, given to you by your culture or your surroundings, or whether those are things that you have actively chosen yourself, those are things that really make a difference when you show up for these things because only from understanding who you are and what your location is in the grand scheme of thing and your own elements of your identity that can allow you to then be able to show up for other people and be able to have um, a degree of perspective taking where if you're just sort of, you know, in your own little bubble and sort of unaware, like you're a fish in water. And I want to ask you, like, what it's like to live in water. And you're like, well, what's water? Because you've never been outside of it or ever had to really think about yourself um, as a cultural being, right? So I think that self-awareness and being aware of your social location is going to go a long way in helping to foster the kind of environment and to engage other people um, in, in who they are. So I would say that self-awareness is something that folks really need to consider and sit with because it's gonna make it easier to come to the table and engage others. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Enzo. Um, I definitely think, well, I definitely agree with what TK said, but I think uh, a big part of it is the accountability that we have to acknowledge and hold accountable. That I think that's a big a thing that sometimes it's often pushed aside or we think people's, their intent is a positive one so we don't hold them accountable for their actions because they thought well, they didn't mean that or they mean they mean something and a positive or they're really trying sometimes if you're not holding them accountable if you're not acknowledging the problem they're not aware that it's a problem so it won't change and you can't you can't get any better if you don't acknowledge it and once you acknowledge it and you hold them accountable you have to have that level of patience so i think those three things working together um, really help and encourage change and make it possible. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Michelle. I'm going to pick up on a question that's coming up around how do you teach self-awareness and bridge that into my response. So you teach self-awareness by, so you learn self-awareness by becoming much more aware of your thoughts. Similar to if you've had a mindfulness or meditation practice, you not, need to start being very aware of the associations that are naturally happening in your brain. By natural, I mean they're learned, but they're happening instantaneously within milliseconds and without your conscious awareness, uh, usually. So you need to become present and mindful of where your brain goes when you're faced with people who are different from who you've experienced in the past, who are less similar to you and less familiar to you. Um, see what those reactions are. And from there, what how does that impact your behavior? So how does being faced with somebody who's in a wheelchair make you feel uncomfortable? Do you engage in a conversation? Do you become more concise, short with the person? Do you try to get away because you're so afraid of saying or doing the wrong thing? What it, how are you responding to difference right now? You need to know that. You need to interrogate your thoughts and you need to start to question the way that that impacts your decision-making and your behavior. That's first and foremost, critically important. Beyond that, there's two other things that I wanna squeak in really quickly. One is that we need to ask questions of one another within our organizations. So the next time you're at work and you hear someone say, they're just not a good fit for our team, you know, they're just not, they don't have the leadership presence, the charisma, whatever it is in your organization, right? They just don't demonstrate the excellence. I want you to ask, we, we need you to ask based on what? Based on what? What are the criteria on which you are making that evaluation of someone's leadership presence, their competence, their qualifications, their charisma, whatever? What are the criteria? 
we need to slow down and we need to ensure that our decisions are evidence-based and reflective of objective criteria that was preset ahead of time. Otherwise, what ends up happening is we go with our gut, we go with what's comfortable, and that tends to be what's similar to you and familiar to you, so what you've experienced in the past. And lastly, and then I will get off the soapbox that I love sitting on, uh, <laughs> and if you know me, you know that I love to talk about this. This needs to be baked into your systems within your organization. So great that we're doing you know, awareness campaigns, great that there's training, great that there's communication strategies. If EDI is not built into the way that you are recruiting and selecting your candidates, if it's not baked into your talent review process, your performance management process, your training and development decision making, your succession planning, if it's not woven in to how your company works and how decisions are being made, then you are not doing EDI work. What you're doing is you're doing some visible, interesting stuff that shows the world that you're doing EDI work, but you're not actually changing the system, the ecosystem in which you operate. And that's what EDI is about. So mm -hmm. interrogate your thoughts, question how you're making associations and how that's affecting your behavior. Ask questions based on what is my favorite. And lastly, ensure that this is absolutely woven in to the systems and practices of your organization. I'll take a step off of my soapbox now. All right. Um, thank you, Michelle. Um, we appreciate a soapbox moment. Um, and I, I want to I want to thank you all for kind of just sharing sharing that. And I think to to Michelle's point of and again tying in that self awareness piece, it's one of those fundamental things that through the Leadership Niagara program um, or Accelerate Civic Leadership program is the foundation of expanding that leadership presence is around self-awareness and it's based on reflection. You can't assess how much you've grown or what growth looks like if you've not stopped to be like, oh wait, where was this fork in the road prior to this? Because what we tend to do, and I'm one of those people, is we tend to move the goalposts every single time. So if we're never stopping to pay attention to what growth looks like, you'll never be able, you'll never be truly satisfied because if you have a growth mindset, you're constantly pursuing the next thing. You're, ne you're trying to level up to the next thing. And so that, that piece about self-awareness also resonates or kind of follows that habit of starting to reflect. And whether through the program, we encourage it through journaling or just times where you're, it, reflection doesn't mean kumbaya, like your hands and the candles and incense. It just means taking time to spend with your own thoughts, to replay the day's events through your through your mind's eye, to assess I'm like, oh wow, I was uncomfortable in this situation, or I really lashed out at this person, but I brought something from home, you know, into the workplace. And we don't realize that we're all on automatic response. We're all navigating through life. It's a video that we show in Leadership Niagara all the time, and I'm sure people might be familiar, but the This Is Water video, which you can find on YouTube, is a perfect example of how we navigate our spaces and the routines of our lives without really thinking about what's happening, right? We're on the go and we're not processing. So I think that self-awareness piece to um, Aaron, I think who asked the question, is really about getting in the habit of spending time in your own head to reflect and process the day's events and what's acting um, on you. Um, and so with that, you know, I also want to say too, like even within the context of Leadership Niagara and being, you know, humble and, you know, be, having the courage to take a look at what's going on, our organization or the program that we've run since 2007 has in some ways been a barometer or a litmus test for um, the Niagara region. And when you look at it from the onset, we are very aware that Leadership Niagara is not that diverse when you look at the participants that have gone through the program, which then begs the question, what can we do to support organizations? Mm -hmm. As Michelle brought up, how do you now start taking this opportunity to ensure that your professional development strategies, your HR strategies, feed and support the diverse members of your population? And it's one thing to think, well, well, Niagara is not diverse, so that makes sense that the, the Leadership Niagara cohort isn't diverse. But as we move towards more diversity, visible diversity, um, we will need, 
it, it is incumbent on us to end this point to keep everybody accountable that we're making the right moves in order to fully incorporate diversity through all elements of our organization. So um, wanted to take that and acknowledge that because that is a humble pie from a leadership Niagara perspective that we've had to sit with in terms of, you know, me looking and thinking, well, leadership Niagara is so white, but is that a, is that a slight against or work? No, not necessarily. It just reflects what would, what's going on in our organizations locally. So it is our work to ensure that we create space that organizations can then put filters in to ensure that there is a diverse pool of people that are being identified or, or seen as leaders to be brought forward for opportunities. So wanted to acknowledge that. Um, it's an elephant in my ear, maybe not for you, but um, so with that, I really want to thank our wonderful uh, panelists, TK, Michelle, and Enzo, uh, for a wonderful uh, discussion. I hope everybody in the room really took something out of this. The chat box has been lighting up and I'm looking forward to um, some questions from the group. So I'm going to hand it over to Leslie who has been curating uh, a couple people that may come mm -hmm. on to ask uh, any questions that we've not addressed yet. So um, I'll hand it over to Leslie. And when Leslie acknowledges you, if you want to come on video, you can ask your question. And then um, if it's directed at any specific panelists first, you can totally do that. We'll take about two questions, two, three questions before we have to wrap up at 1130. So Leslie. Amazing. The chat box has been on fire. Some um, privately, which I really uh, just want to humbly say thank you to people for uh, trusting me and, and asking me questions behind the scene. Um, uh, but they're all, these are so great. Okay, so I have a few questions lined up. Um, if you're not selected yet, or if I haven't had a chance to touch base with you on your question, I apologize in advance. There's um, so many moving parts over here. So I'm going to start with um, David. So David, if you want to pop on, you um, popped a question right early. So uh, go for it. Well, this is being tripped over and talked about a little bit, but I think I want to pose it as a question, but it may be rhetorical, sort of the, when we're talking about leadership, we're talking about CEOs, shareholders, and boards of directors. I haven't heard much talk about the return of investment. I've heard a lot of, this is the right thing to do, and we should do it. But if we're sitting in the office of a CEO, we've got to show him the value of it in terms of dollars and cents. They have to return a profit. So I think more spotlight or how do we show the spotlight to ask a question on the simple ROI of the EDI programs in our companies, whether they're big or small? That's the simple question about it. Thank you, David. Um, Michelle or TK, anyone? Don't fight. So if I'm, I could be mistaken, but I think Michelle might actually have the, the actual numbers. Um, I don't have the actual numbers uh, in my head, uh, but I know there has been research done by a number of different places um, that show the return on investment when you compare, for example, a uh, homogenous working group with a diverse working group, that the diverse working group has like, a, a t I think 20 or 30% more. There's one that looks specifically at when you include women and there's one that looks at when you include women and you know people of color or other uh, manifestations of difference. And so the results are that it is better because you have more, the people who are different are bringing different things to the table. And so they are able to um, think more uh, effectively around what's going to be great for customers or how this new product can work, et cetera, et cetera. I don't have the numbers in front of me, unfortunately, to give you a clear and precise answer to your question, but I would say that the research, lots of research is out there that demonstrates, for example, that ROI increases when you have a diverse board. And when you have uh, diverse, so those that research has been done and that is out there and uh, maybe offline, I can supply folks with some of that information. But I'll hand it over to Michelle who might have. I can. And, and I'll got a feisty. Oh, sorry, Cassie has also provided a link. Sorry, Shane, go ahead. Oh yeah, I was just about to say, uh, Cassie uh, within the in the chat, I think provided a link 
as well to uh, mckinsey.com and just a report that they recently did um, as I think as late as May on the diversity piece. So um, Dave, um, I think it's there if you scroll up to the chat box where we can resend it to you as well. I saw her her link and I was, I mean, I asked a question before that link came. Yeah. And I understand this, but I, I, I kept hearing the, it's the right thing to do and we should do it and we all want to do it, but that doesn't convince a CEO. So I just wanted to shine a light on that just a little bit more specifically. That's that's awesome, David. I think we'll pass it over to Michelle because I can see by her body language yes. she is busting with excitement to give us some information. So go Look, for it, Michelle. I want to be a little feisty here and I want to say like absolutely the business case has been proven. We've seen this over time both in organizations but also in academia that it's been the, the link between performance, innovation, creativity and diversity has been proven. And so when a CEO sits down with, with myself or with someone I'm working with and says, prove to me how doing the right thing is going to make me money. The conversation I have is tell me why you need to do the right thing because it's going to put more money in your pocket. Like treating people ethically and fairly to me is regardless, like you just need to do that. Um, and if you need to be proven how it's going to pad your pockets over time, then that is a sign that you really don't get it. And we need to do some work with you so that you can so recognize that being fair and equitable is, you know, regardless of the monetary outcomes, it, it's just the thing that you need to do. So yes, the business case is there and we can all pull the data and don't get me wrong, I absolutely inform my strategy on this is how it's gonna improve your retention efforts or your problem solving or your creativity. But by the same token, we're past that now. Like we have to move past the business case. We all just need to accept that this is what we need to do. That's awesome. Thank you so much. Great question. Um, so now we're gonna move on to Cassie. Cassie, you had a, um, a question. so. Uh, if you want to pop yourself on camera, if you're comfortable, or just uh, unmute. I'm using a different camera than what I'm looking at, so it's a bit weird. Um, <laughs> excellent conversation so far. Um, my question that I asked earlier, I'm going to expand a little bit on, because uh, some of the chain had asked. Um, there's many different approaches to creating equity, diversity, and inclusion work. Um, a lot of things have been mentioned already, affinity groups, task forces, committees. Um, if you look at the way different um, plans are set out or organizations approach it in different locations, some of them have one committee that has individuals from lots of different groups. Some have you know, up to nine different committees that all uh, fold into a larger equity diversity committee. Is there one approach that would be recommended or what would your recommendations for Niagara be moving this work forward. As this work is moving forward, um, do you guys have some specific um, direction or uh, encouragement for us here in Niagara? Um, I can, yeah, just a, a little bit. I think it's a great question. Um, and unfortunately, I'm not going to give an answer that you'll probably find satisfactory because I really think that one size does not fit all. Mm -hmm. um, you know, your organization, you know, depending on your organization and who your customers are and who you're trying to engage um, are all going to help inform what is going to make the best sense for your organization and you know the, whatever happens to be your competitive advantage or whether that's going to evolve and whether this is going to be a part of that evolution i think all has to be taken into consideration um so i would say that for niagara businesses um you know you really have to assess again where you are and where you want to go in terms of how that aligns with your organization and your organization strategy moving forward. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, awesome. Michelle or Enzo, do you have anything to add to Cassius? Um, just to add on that, what TK just said, it's I think a lot of people are looking for because they want to do something and they want to do that change. So they're looking for that checklist. And like TK just said, there there is no checklist necessarily to just get the job done and have it done and have it dealt with. But on the positive spin on that, the checklist is developed by you. So it has to be personalized. It has to be with all your coworkers. It has to be with your community. And you have to identify um, your demographic. You have to identify who are who your customers are. 
who your uh, workers are. It has to be everyone together. So if you look at it that way, it should be an empowering, positive thing that you are in charge of making this checklist, of putting it together, identifying the needs, as long as it's an open dialogue and it's a safe place for people to discuss and share their feelings and share their fears and what they want to have improvement on, you, it, it can be done. It's just the initial sit down and comfort level. Once everyone feels that they're comfortable to bring things to the table, a lot will get done and it'll move rather quickly once mm. that part's done. But I think human nature, that's the hardest part for us to have that chill time to sit down and be humble with each other and an open mind. That's the hardest part. But once you take that, the rest will naturally organically flow, I feel. And I think Shane had mentioned before the growth mindset. And, and so I think you just hit on that, really embracing that growth mindset, um, especially when, when triggered and, and when there's a lot of emotion around it. So that was fabulous. And I wanted to add to, to um, Enzo's point quickly um, in terms of... Um, Oh Lord, it just, I'm getting old. Never mind. Michelle, I forgot where I was going with that. <laughs> Nothing to add. We can go to the next question. Okay. Awesome. So we have uh, two questions left. And uh, I think given the timing, not that I would want anyone to edit their answers, but we can fit them both in if we, um, if we nail them. <laughs> so um, Jasmine, are you, uh, are you, oh, there you are. Hi Jasmine. Hello. You are on. Hello. Hi, hello. So many familiar faces, feels good. Hi. <laughs> um, so my question kind of dovetails from some topics that were kind of covered. Um, and I'm just wondering if you can kind of speak to this. So I've noticed within some organizations, there's often this like head in the clouds vibe because the members of the organization are not directly impacted by the intersectional barriers that are present. So I'm wondering what your thoughts are and what can be done at more of like a grassroots level to help support the onlys in working in these organizations. Um, is there room for bigger focus on like the development and educational and emotional support for the only um, to have these conversations with their employers um, about the changes that need to be made within that organization so that we're seen as more than just like the angry black woman or the oversensitive advocate, that kind of thing. Um, so I'm going to quickly respond in two parts of bridging my Cassie. I just remembered my old brain just remembered. Um, the, what I was going to say is to Enzo's point is to add, I would also recommend having an external uh, voice. Um, so try not to do this all internally in terms of boss or your employees only try to get an external person to Michelle's and TK's point earlier that you want to ensure that even if the space is being created, that it's not all of us that live and breathe in that space, because I do tend to find a workplace could be a replica of our own Facebook groups and or curated Instagram pages, where it's people that already think and, and view things like us. So try to get somebody else outside of your everyday work context to be part or lead that dialogue uh, within that space. And I think that um, to, to Jasmine's point, um, could also be something that plays well um, in that as well. But I wanted to say that before I forget again. Um, TK or um, Enzo, if you want to respond. So, um, sorry, Enzo, you go ahead, please. No, go right ahead. Go right ahead. Okay, we'll be like, no, you first. No, you. No, you. <laughs> so, Jasmine, I, I, I'm trying to actually remember your question, but I know that there were elements around, like, how do we support the folks who are you know, in the thick of it, maybe the only one, um, et cetera. Um, that's, it's really hard because a lot of folks, I think if they're members of the dominant culture, don't necessarily have that perspective or even know that there's something going on. And so I want to highlight dialogue as a very important way to be able to have that conversation. And I distinguish dialogue from debate or discussion because all three are very different things and the outcomes are very different. So if folks can engage in a dialogue around how are you feeling? Um, are you okay? Um, do you need anything? Those are the things that are going to be helpful. 
And, you know, dialogue is important because the focus is on listening and understanding. Whereas when you're going into something in a debate stance, there's going to be a winner and there's going to be a loser. Mm -hmm. And that's the wrong approach to use when you're trying to understand and, you know, develop and ensure that people feel that sense of belonging. So um, I think those are some of the things that I would recommend in terms of, you know, and if you're coming from the perspective of a racialized person or somebody who is different in the organization, I, I would have to say handle with care because power is a real thing. And when, if somebody is going to be, you know, threatened by engaging in a dialogue or feel whatever, then it is a very difficult situation to be in. And I, there's not an easy answer to give you similar to the last question. It's going to be a case by case basis, but I would say find your allies, even if you're the only one. My experience in Niagara region is that there have been so many people who have been supportive, who have been welcoming, who have really gone out of their way um, to check in and make sure I'm okay and present themselves in a you know, way that they're ready to listen and learn and to assist. So find your angels because they're out there and uh, stay connected and I would say keep the dialogue going. Thank you. Amazing. Okay, so we, if, did anyone have anything else to say or can we fit in our one last uh, question? So I don't want to cut Michelle or Enzo off if they have something to add. Awesome. Jermaine, thank you for being patient. Oh, no problem. Um, I love the discussion, just hearing what everyone has to say. And I will try very hard not to make this a super duperly long question, but it's sort of like <laughs> just um, a three part question around equity, intersectionality and accountability, all things that you've all mentioned. Um, so just sort of considering conversations that oftentimes use equity and equality as interchangeable terms when it comes to diversity hiring and initiatives. Could you explain the difference between the two, particularly the ways in which equity oftentimes serves as actually counterintuitive, um, equality serves as counterintuitive to equitable hiring and workplace initiatives, especially as we look to like intersectionality and how it is that oftentimes these initiatives tend to privilege, you know, white women over say queer women of color or women of color, um, cis men of color or white cis gay men, you know, how do we bring intersectionality into this conversation of equity? And then lastly, to Michelle's point from the beginning of the conversation around how all of this needs to be data driven, um, what methods and what initiatives would you sort of say companies need to actually tangibly implement as opposed to just saying we're equity diversity hirers, is there a need for them to show their books, sort of like take their surveys of their employees and say, hey, these are employees of color. These are like, and this is how it's grown over the years. These are our mission statements. That's like the percentages that we're meeting. Or is there like, you just can say you're an equity hire and that's, no one can check you on that. And those are, that's the question. And you have one minute to answer so that Shane can finish on time. Cause I know he's over there with, uh, uh, we're like, we have to finish. <laughs> Awesome, Jerrine. Thank you. Um, anybody could go, um, Michelle or Enzo or TK. I feel this is the strong Michelle answer. Okay. <laughs> Michelle, you're on the floor. So in a nutshell, equity recognizes that not everyone is dealt the same hand of cards, right? That by virtue of being born um, in a particular racial group, for example, a particular socioeconomic group, for example, that you are going to face barriers that impede your advancement and your success in this world. So equity is about how do we ensure that we're removing barriers so that people can be treated fairly in life, Equality is treating everyone the same. It's assuming that everyone has the same fair shot, that regardless of where you came from or what your identity is, that you have the same um, possibility for outcomes. It's the idea that we can all pull our, ourselves up by our bootstraps, right? We know that that's not the case. There's a ton of data to support that. So our organizations need to focus on equity. To your point about intersectionality, critically important, we know that women are held back in the workplace. We know that Black women are particularly held back in the workplace. Black women are 18% less likely to get promoted than comparable white women peers or white peers. 
for the same, same performance evaluation, same level of commitment, et cetera, same tenure, white, black women are less likely to get promoted. So we absolutely have to have nuanced discussions about you know, race and um, sexual orientation and abilities when we're talking about diversity. We can't consider this in terms of monolithic categories. There has to be that intersectionality component. And there's ways that we can do that within organizations. Your data collection should factor in intersectionality and all of the work that you're doing. It should not just look at people into discrete categories. It should be talking about about how people are multidimensional. Mm -hmm. Bam. Michelle, um, <laughs> <laughs> I know that was a feat, so I really want to thank everybody for joining us. I also want to thank uh, Jermaine and David and Jasmine um, for asking their questions. And I really want to, before we kind of sign off, um, again, just thank you all for joining us. I know this has been a really interesting uh, initiative for us and we look forward to continuing um, these types of community conversation in the in the coming weeks um, so stay tuned for that but again thank you for joining us on um, part two of what can we do a conversation about improving diversity and inclusion at work and I want to thank again our sponsors um, thank you to Nikki and Roland Jagir uh, for stepping forward and showing up as a community member um, and helping us uh, facilitate this dialogue today. So thank you to everybody and we look forward uh, to our next uh, community conversation um, and we hope you can join us then. Have a great day. Bye.